computer. I don't trust it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the ICA 2020 theme session panel entitled Open Science and Additional Concerns When Working with Marginalized Populations. I'm Katie Pierce. Uh, my co-panelists will be introducing themselves um, in a moment. Uh, just to introduce ourselves as a collective, as a group, um, with the open science and open communication theme this year, a group of us that are communication scholars uh, want to reflect upon concerns that we have about open science practices that may be of particular concern when studying marginalized populations. We find that often open science is framed as uh, beneficial for scholars that want to advance their research questions and that we as scholars and each individual will talk about this in their own presentations uh, are concerned about thinking about individual participants for whom open science practices may increase their risk significantly. Although, of course, we agree that transparency and the creation of public goods are noble goals. We as a group and as individuals will talk about um, what transparency may mean when studying communication with more marginalized groups and people in this panel study a variety of marginalized groups, this minors, low socioeconomic status, LGBTQ+, etc. Um, or when studying entities that may have uh, malicious intent towards researchers themselves and what open science could mean for that. Um, we, of course, advocate for more contextualization and more consideration with unanticipated consequences that may result from open science practices. So each panelist will uh, briefly present on their perspective based on their research context and their experience um, and what they anticipate or what they have themselves have experienced related to various open science principles. Um, then we will talk as a group answering some broader questions that um, may come up. And of course, with this being um, an asynchronous format, we wish that we could engage more directly in the moment with audience members, but we will be happy to talk with people in the comments. Um, really, we see ourselves as people that um, embrace some of the aspects of open science and open communication, but we just want to make sure that uh, anyone engaging with these sort of principles is thinking a little bit more, a few steps ahead about what the broader implications can be, in particular for uh, those of us on this panel with participants that may be in more marginalized positions. And so we do not find ourselves opposed to open science as, it, as a whole, but just want people to be engaging in more cautious behavior. So with that, I'm going to mute myself and I'm going to hand it over to Jessica Vitek, who will be speaking first. Hi, I'm Jessica Vitek. I'm an associate professor at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. And for the last three years, I've been working with libraries in low income neighborhoods across the state of Maryland in the US to understand privacy and security challenges faced by both library staff and the patrons of those libraries, and to develop resources to help people protect their personal information from malicious actors. The libraries that we are working with cater predominantly to marginalized groups. We did this on purpose. This is a big part of the research project. So this includes the poor, people of color, immigrants, and more. And these people often have little skill in using computers and may have low English proficiency, but at the same time, the government, employers, and other groups are requiring them to submit sensitive information through online portals and forms. Many of these people rely on public library computers and library staff to help them through this process, but this can also expose them to serious data privacy risks, ranging from fraud to identity theft and everything in between. Unfortunately, those risks are often far down the ladder for these patrons who have much more immediate concerns. So filing for unemployment, getting health care, you know, ensuring that they're going to get paid so that they can buy groceries. Privacy and security just can't hold up against those types of needs. 
And when we look at existing research on privacy literacy and privacy skill development, we find that there just isn't much research that is focusing on these groups. It's hard to collect data from these groups. We tend to rely on folks who have high uh, technology skills and people who are more middle and upper class. This is one of the reasons we pursued this project, but uh, you know, it has a number of challenges when you are trying to do this type of data collection. So we recognize that as outsiders, when we started this data collection, we might have a difficult time getting the trust of the people we wanted to talk to. Depending on their situation, some people uh, may have been nervous about talking to academic researchers about their financial situation or other sensitive topics. And also in light of the current administration in the US, uh, their policies on immigration, some people might have feared revealing too much information that could somehow affect their immigration status. To mitigate these concerns, we worked with library staff and have them serve as information intermediaries in both the recruitment and data collection process. So library staff are among the few people, certainly in the US, that are still considered highly trusted. Uh, research has shown this. And we use them to recruit participants to help put those participants at ease. We went to each library branch and had meetings with the staff before we began data collection to talk about the project and our research goals and to describe the types of patrons we wanted to talk to. The library staff then facilitated the sign up uh, and provided space for us to conduct the interviews in each branch. To help us reach out to non-English speaking families, we've also partnered with a local Latino nonprofit uh, that works with immigrants and other groups and they connected us with members of, of their group to help ensure that those voices were not left out of the conversation. And then the last thing I want to mention is that we've also thought about ways to increase agency among our participants and have them be direct contributors to the final resources that we are developing. Marginalized groups often feel like they're not represented in policies aimed at quote unquote normal families because they might not have the technologies or access described in those policies. For this project, we're using uh, participant design methods to involve patrons and library staff throughout the development process. And this uses an iterative process of development, feedback, making changes based on that feedback, going back to the to same population again. Uh, this ensures that the final resources are aligned with the needs of our stakeholders and that they have a and they have agency in the types of materials that we're developing. All right, thank you so much. Uh, next up, uh, Filippo. And I'm... All right, I'll uh, take over from this. Thank you. Uh, my name is Filippo Trevisan. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication at American University in Washington, DC, where I am also the deputy director of the Institute on Disability and Public Policy. And uh, you know, a lot of my work uh, really has to do with participatory platforms and whether and how they help the emergence or hinder the emergence of new voices in public policy debates, in particular, with relation to healthcare, uh, but also social security uh, and a series of other uh, uh, debates that relate to particularly people with disabilities. And that's where a lot of my work has been over the last 15 years, really, looking at uh, how different platforms can facilitate or hinder the participation of people with disabilities and citizens with disabilities in politics at all levels starting from the grassroots level and all the way up to more formal ways of participation through elections as either voters or candidates uh, or uh, members of campaigns and professionals on those campaigns and so on. And so and when I think about the theme of the conference, uh, really there's a lot that uh, gives me pause with open communication and open science. And I think, you know, ask us to reflect, but uh, it doesn't mean that we need to think about it uh, certainly only in, in potentially risky or negative terms. I think there is a lot of potential there as well. And really what uh, I see as the main potential for people with disabilities as it relates to my own research about marginalized communities and populations more broadly is this idea that uh, you know, through open, the open sharing of data, 
uh, the voices of participants that all of us on this panel work with uh, may be able to reach a larger number of researchers, uh, which could in a certain way help address one of the longstanding problems when it comes to uh, researching uh, with marginalized populations, which is, you know, collecting this data can be really challenging sometimes. Uh, these are difficult to reach populations. Uh, there is logistical issues that come with it. There is issues of, you know, methods sometimes not being fit for purpose and needing to be adapted. Uh, there are issues with um, the need to establish trust, as uh, Jessica was mentioning earlier on, and what solutions need to be um, created around that. And so the idea of having a data set that, uh, you know, somebody has taken the time to collect properly and maybe create a partnership with these communities and so on that could be shared with others is really, really interesting in terms of expanding the reach of these voices within research. Um, however, you know, there are some risks, obviously, as well. And I want to focus on, um, you know, two, two sets of risks, maybe, in, in, in my next set of remarks here. Um, they don't, risks, I don't think, don't just relate to uh, the ethical conduct of research, which obviously is an area uh, for concern. Uh, when it comes to uh, sharing data with uh, other researchers outside the primary research team. Uh, but there is also a risk that relates to uh, the comprehensiveness of the data that's being collected and also, you know, ultimately the validity of that data. And I think, you know, there are two ways of looking at this. Uh, the first one uh, comes up with social media content research, both in a sort of uh, big data scraping kind of uh, set of skills and then with in-depth qualitative work as well because marginalized populations and I will say people with disabilities in particular have been targeted for a long time by government agencies this was even before the internet era through monitoring processes right, when it comes to dealing with the state uh, and so on uh, sometimes uh, this has had to do with you know, pretty uncontroversial topics such as social security claims, for example. And in my own work, I see that reflected in the conversations I've had over the last 15 years with uh, disabled activists and people with disabilities more generally. Really very profound worries around security, security of data, uh, fears of being monitored. Uh, and certain topics come up in these conversations more than others. Social security is certainly one of them. Another one of them is talking politics online and whether that's appropriate or not and whether people are seeing us themselves as potentially more at risk than others populations and where that puts them in terms of what they decide or decide to say and not say online and so the kind of go-to uh, diy solution to this tends to be self-censorship right and uh, however uh, uh you know deciding not to talk about a certain topic online that means that the data set we can collect doesn't cover uh, some of the uh, important issues that the communities uh, we are interested in working with, uh, you know, are concerned about. Uh, and <clears throat> in the last few years, particularly since uh, the Trump administration, uh, you know, came to power in the United States, there have been repeated uh, attempts at uh, enforcing a set of uh, monitoring standards on social security claimants which have raised the level of concern for people with disabilities uh, in the US. And you know, as one advocate put it in the uh, New York Times in an article that came out about this last year, he said, you know, with social security snooping on Facebook or Twitter, uh, you don't want anything on there that shows you out playing Frisbee. Uh, and you know, unquote. Uh, this doesn't mean, however, that people with disabilities aren't out there playing Frisbee. It means they just don't put it online. And so um, it may seem trivial, but it just signifies the fact, I think, that, uh, you know, uh, the way in which we think about how we share data and how that, you know, uh, contributes to a bigger narrative that's out there about monitoring uh, by government agencies or institutions more generally, and how some of this data could be used against people, really does a disservice uh, to uh, the quality of the data that we can collect. Uh, if we don't design these interventions correctly and if we don't communicate them uh, well enough. Uh, so it is reasonable to think that the more um, forceful open science approach, if you want, uh, again, if it is not communicated correctly and some of these concerns are not mitigated, might actually 
cause detriment to the quality of data. And the second, so this was one set of concerns. The second set of concerns that I want to highlight is, you know, around, and I, I assume others on this call will also comment on this, is around qualitative data and what happens to anonymity and confidentiality in particular. And it, if we can even think of sharing qualitative data, uh, you know, through uh, an open science uh, approach. Um, and I think this trade-off is particularly marked uh, because this, uh, data, as I was saying earlier on, is difficult to collect and it's time consuming and it will be particularly beneficial to other researchers. But at the same time, there are issues that are remain, I, I think, unresolved around how to do this uh, safely, uh, so to speak. So what does this all mean when we think about open science? Should we do it? Should we not? Should we just forget about it uh, and, you know, not, not even want to go there? Um, then there is a risk with taking this kind of blanket approach as well. Uh, and the risk is one of exclusion. And I've seen it, uh, you know, uh, constantly in uh, uh, disability, doing disability research with an approach that historically IRBs and ethical committees have tended to have towards people with disabilities, no matter what the disability is, uh, to just say, you know, this is a vulnerable population, we need to protect them. It's better not to do research about these issues or not to involve their voices in this research because uh, it's, it's just too sensitive when you bring up a lot of issues. And that has created a lot of research about disability that's missing the voice of people with disabilities, right? And it has kind of exacerbated this divide between professionals and medical experts in particular, and those who are their constituents, and those who I think us as researchers should be seeing as our primary constituents and stakeholders. Um, and so, uh, you know, we should try to find a way to maximize the benefits of an open science approach. Uh, the way to do that, uh, you know, I might raise more questions than, than I have answers for here, but I think there are at least two levels at which we can think uh, about interventions. One of them is a more uh, sort of high tech uh, level uh, set of issues that have to do with security and how we, um, you know, design systems uh, and think about access to this data, right? And another set of solutions might revolve around just rediscovering some of the key tenets of ethical research. Uh, and so, you know, as I was saying before, we have to think carefully about who has access to this data and what the systems look like to enable to uh, maybe uh, enable both stakeholders uh, in relation to the communities, but also primary researchers who collected that data to have some say in who can access it and maybe vet some of these requests and think about what part of that data may be more sensitive and maybe they might want to think about uh, whether it should be shared in its original form or not. Although again, with redacting data, there might be a, an issue of you know, distorting potentially participants' voices as well, which I see as problematic uh, in that sense. And then the second set of issues, I think, relate to reconceptualizing risk. And thinking about risk is not just, you know, stepping away from designing risk around groups of people. And so this is taking this blank blanket approach to certain populations, uh, but rather uh, thinking about risk in more situational terms. And I think that's really where a lot of the Association of Internet Researchers ethical guidelines are also going. Uh, but I think it really kind of pays uh, dividends to think about risk in terms of at risk in terms of what are all of the different variables that constitute risk. There isn't just, you know, somebody belonging to a certain group or having a certain identity, but it is also about, you know, what it is the issue that they're talking about and who has access to this data and, uh, you know, who may or may not be able to identify these people. What does the platform or the data we collected from a certain platform, what is it likely to be, uh, like in the future in terms of discoverability or searchability. It doesn't mean that something that cannot be searched through a search engine today won't be, uh, you know, will be blocked tomorrow uh, either. And so uh, as we think about all of this, I think there are many solutions we could come up with, um, but what really brings this back all together, whether we want to give more power to the primary researchers to, you know, vet some of the requests to use that data or whether we want to give or build into these systems some um, opportunities for people who want to use uh, data from an open access database, particularly if it's quality data, to maybe go back to uh, the participants and ask them whether they think it's appropriate to use some of that data in certain contexts and so on. Uh, 
what really brings this all together, I think it's a renewed commitment we need to have as researchers to put in the individual at the, cent at the center of these decisions that we're making, and really the principle of respect that comes out of the Belmont report uh, uh, for those who are familiar with you know what regulates federally funded research in the United States but uh, really the idea of letting the individual be in control as much as possible and so I think that's a challenge uh, for us but uh, it, it's a good challenge for us to be aware of and to think about going forward. I'm done. <laughs> Great thanks Filippo. All right next up is Cheryl. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm Cheryl Soriano. I'm professor in communication in the LSL University here in Manila. Uh, I guess before talking about my own research context, I wanted to start with an interesting chat I had with a geographer just this morning um, on open street maps, how this project lauded for its altruism and had created plenty of opportunities to work with open data may also have a colonizing tendency. It opens a discourse amongst mappers that everything ought and can be mapped and may sometimes tend to forget that open data on lands and villages, including those with an indigenous ancestral domain, may be used by government, military and capitalist business to the disadvantage of vulnerable communities. Kind of like a modern day conquest. The open street map that benefited from the noble labor of mappers was apparently used for the recent bombing of one of our rural communities. And so I reflect on that while I discuss some of the short and long term ethical negotiations involved in research with politically vulnerable and economically marginalized research populations. So during my PhD dissertation, that was many years ago, I had been exposed to the activist work of subnational groups as well as an indigenous group as two of my case studies. Following a year of field work, I managed to gather data after gaining trust of my respondents and this allowed me to be in active conversation about the multiple strategies that they took for political activism and advancing their struggles in physical, virtual and hybrid spaces. For context, I was pertaining to a Muslim minority group that has been struggling for autonomy following over half a century of violent armed conflict with the Philippine government and amidst a predominantly Christian society. The other case is an indigenous activist group that has also been clamoring for self-determination for many decades now of their ancestral lands and fighting mining operations for decades, but it's also often branded by government as terrorists and communists, until now, in fact and with some members receiving death threats constantly. In many instances, my respondents shared and gave me access to much more information than I expected them to share. Eventually, I became part of online discussion groups that gave me privileged access to information and insight about the use of hybrid spaces for strategic political organizing. In the course of analysis and writing, I had to perform considerable negotiations on which of the data shared with me would not compromise their safety or put them in more vulnerable positions, despite them giving me full consent to the research, in fact. During the project, a member of the group I interviewed disappeared and never resurfaced. In writing the thesis and also the articles from that research, I had to revert to my interviewees back and forth and per perform substantial self-reflection, but due to space limits, was not able to write about these complex negotiations in the articles. I also realized that there were data that were okay to be divulged at the time of research, but would eventually put them in risky situations later when conflicts spike. Since then, I've been involved in research concerning digital media and marginalized groups, youth from vulnerable populations and precarious workers or online freelancers, some of whom have shared experiences of involvement with risky online jobs as well as journalists covering the government's war on drugs who continually experience trauma and threat from private messages and social media attacks. I've also been in conversation with colleagues who conduct research with trolls and content moderators and understand the care and ethical considerations needed in gathering and protecting the data obtained from these already vulnerable populations. So interestingly, last year at a panel in an international conference for Asian scholars, I saw a panel that applied open science principles to media studies and humanities research. The project had a website which is built around a collection of community-based projects from global collaborators on universal themes like food, place, practice. And I was fascinated by the project as it facilitated learning and exchange from the direct engagement of artists, ethnographers, community activists, and civil society actors. The site works like an archive where contributors can share images and video footages from their research, and these texts can be reused and remixed by the members of the community. 
And so I was struck by it and I was invited to join. And in the, in the efforts to internationalize our research and examine our experiences in the light of research experiences from the lens of people from other parts of the world, this collaborative effort appeals compelling. And therefore, to address one of the reviewers' point in this panel on the extent to which researchers working with marginalized populations already face obligations to share data upon request, it is not an obligation, but understandably seen as an emerging innovative practice. However, in reflection, I was concerned how the same spirit of sharing footages, recordings, or images can be applied in relation to the complex negotiations that I have earlier mentioned about the research that I do with marginalized populations. What implications would sharing raw footages and images have for these communities that I have studied? Even with an attempt to blur faces or anonymize data, how can I be assured that the data would not be misunderstood, misinterpreted, or misused by the next user? also given the context of varied cultural and political systems globally. If parts of the data would be shared, in what ways can this be shared such that it protects my participants while being able to maintain the substance of the data? To what extent would rigorous anonymization of research data affect the utility of the data to allow it for reproducibility? So in closing, I'd like to reflect on open science's thrust of facilitating transparency and replicability, two principles apparently underlying scientific research. At the heart of the open science movement is a conviction that research from the sciences to the humanities must be performed in dialogue with society, kind of a responsibility that predicates openness as the core organizing principle for scientific practice. I think though that the question of openness to whom might matter more here, the quality and validity of ethnographic research is measured not in terms of whether it can be replicated, but in terms of how well our research speaks to the reality that we write about. And in my research with marginalized populations, I recognize the need to be an, an open and continuing dialogue with the communities that I study as regards the data and how I interpret the data. And so while I do not particularly aim for replicability, the idea is to understand the specific historical and social conditions underlying and impacting the engagements of the marginalized populations. And while comparing the findings with other works would be critical, the replicability or reproducibility of the conditions is not my key aim, but to explore the specific conditions that operate in specific contexts. And so to end, making data from research with vulnerable populations open will require a significant amount of reflection and negotiation for researchers and may lose the nuance of analysis with attempts to replication. The labor of thinking through this carefully is also not currently featured in most university incentive systems. And I think it would be imperative to more, do more empirical work to understand how researchers of communication and marginality across varied contexts identify ethical negotiations and risks involved in research with vulnerable populations. And often there's no space in journals for this discussion, as well as the potential downstream consequences of data availability for misuse, mislabeling and control. I think a discussion on the ethics of open science practice needs to be an ongoing conversation in professional associations like ICA and even in our university research committees and ethical boards, especially for research concerning marginalized populations. Lander, thank you. Thanks so much, Cheryl. All right, I am now ending my role as moderator and I'm going to speak as a participant on this panel. Uh, so for decades, researchers have been thinking about ways to mitigate and manage risk for their participants. And when anyone fills out an IRB application, they answer questions about this. Uh, my research takes place in an authoritarian, in authoritarian political settings. Um, and so for me, when I have to answer those questions about risk, I'm already entering an environment in which uh, opening the door every morning uh, means that my participants are uh, entering a risky environment. And within uh, authoritarian research, people call this cultures of fear, where daily life involves many risk uh, and that people have um, a very complex set of uh, practices about making decisions about risk. So when you enter into this as a research context, the way that you are anticipating the potential risk that people uh, will encounter by being a participant in your research, and both in the traditional sense. Am I going to interview you? Am I going to give you a survey? And now in the scraping of social media data in which they're not 
actively consenting to be a participant in your research, uh, you are, uh, as a researcher, uh, entering this culture of risk in ways that uh, more often than not is because of the increased visibility of individuals and their thoughts and beliefs and actions, putting them in riskier situations. Moreover, the ability to anticipate risk in the future is nearly impossible. You don't know who's going to uh, come in control of data. And this is especially concerning for me because I often am working with younger participants for whom, you know, this is not to throw shade at younger people, but are not always making the calculations thinking about them, their future selves. Um, so within this, um, when I think about open science practices, that is just throwing another layer of complexity in the ways that I have to be thinking about risk. Um, I have to say that it's very difficult for me though because I also am very committed to uh, trying to make scientific research more available to people in the places that I study. My own research, for example, I always write lay abstracts. I, want people to have access to my research studies. I want people in the countries I study that want to be researchers, making that more available for them, uh, even though they might not have the infrastructure or the access to be able to do so. And so those aspects of open science are really appealing to me. Um, but uh, I just want to give a couple examples of things that I've encountered that when I think about if open science and open communication principles were more widely adopted, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the Q&A, for example, if journals required pre-registration of studies or um, data sets may be made available, experiences that I've had over the years that um, I would hope for people would, would cause them a, a moment of pause. Uh, one ex such example is uh, when I was a graduate student and early in my career, I wrote studies almost entirely based on uh, public opinion data that was collected by NGOs in the countries I study and then annually published. And this was great for me as a graduate student. Every year I got this great new data set um, and I would do these uh, analyses. Uh, but then I, uh, I wrote up a study that I made some claims that were threatening to one of the governments that I study. Um, it was not in politically sensitive data that was collected, but I interpreted it in a way that was threatening to them. Um, and I wrote up an article about it. And uh, the you know, various authorities visited this NGO and they said, who's this Katie Pierce that works for you? Um, that's writing these things. And they're like, what? We just put this data set, this SPSS data set online. Um, you know, we don't know what people do with it. And then this group was closed. And so one, this entirely destroyed my relationship with this group that was doing really good work um, because they got in trouble because of things I wrote. And now also no data has been collected in that country since 2013. Like I personally am responsible for many, many researchers to not have data collection. They collect in the other countries, but not in one country. Um, I feel horrible about that. I'm mad about that. I want that data still. Um, and obviously also, you know, I feel incredibly guilty that people lost their jobs because of what I did. And so, you know, this is an extreme example, but it's not impossible to imagine that sort of thing happening. Um, Another example just happened last week. Um, uh, for years, I've been tracking various social media accounts of uh, individuals or not real individuals uh, in the countries I study. And originally, that was often the governments themselves creating fake accounts to then astroturf people or attack people. And, uh, you know, when I started doing this work um, five, six years ago, this was very exciting, interesting wow, that government doing that, oh, this horrible government, that's terrible. Uh, just recently, uh, a pro-democracy group uh, started creating this series of accounts that would be like Javid123, Javid1234, Javid12345, and it was created five minutes in sequence with each other. Like you didn't need such sophisticated analytical tools to see that these were created accounts, right? And then they were just writing the same thing, praising the leader over and over again. I pointed this out on Twitter. 
Wow, that's a lot of new accounts created without profile pictures, sending the same text, and uh, immediately I was attacked. Even though I just made an observation that, you know, was true. Um, but, um, but I was making this observation about the good guys, not the bad guys, the authoritarian regime. But I also understand that the good guys, the pro-democracy guys, really don't need me observing that they are engaging in the exact same behavior that the government did using, you know, this is a cheap way for them to muddy the waters on social media. Um, they don't want me highlighting this because then, you know, a government newspaper picks it up and they're like, look what they're doing. And so this was a really difficult thing for me, right? Because I personally agree with the pro-democracy people. I think that democracy would be a I don't know, something not authoritarianism would be a good idea in these countries I study but um, at the same time it's like in terms of me as a researcher it was interesting to me that the pro-democracy people were doing the same technique I took down the tweet I continued to be attacked by these people and then I think also wow next time I need to do an interview study are these people going to remember this and hold it against me that that I'm supposed to be on their side, and that's part of me getting access to interview them, is that they think that like I you know, agree with them. Am I harming this very, uh, very uh, difficult you know, trust relationship that I've been building over many, many years? Yeah, that was a big screw up for me. Um, and I, and the same thing with like the social media data I download, even though it's available to anybody, if I took those data downloads and then put them up online, what could happen with those data? Or is me just downloading it and then having it online hurting anyone? So just to give some examples that I could imagine other people might uh, have, you know, could, could normal open science practices that had really severe unintended consequences. So um, and the same thing with also just putting articles up online, right? That like, yes, I want people to read my research, but I don't want people that are gonna hurt me or hurt my research assistants or hurt my participants later to read my research. What do I do? I'm protected by the paywalls, um, even though I don't like that idea. So these are just to share some of the things I think about sometimes and that when I see uh, efforts at more broadly wanting open science principles, I think about then would I not be comfortable publishing in that journal? Like what would happen if this became the norm? Um, and I need to be making these complicated negotiations with my participants and myself at all times. Uh, so that is what, even though I, I like some of the ideas, I would not want it to be mandatory in the least or normative. Um, so with that, Second, now I have to reach down from my notes. Uh, Adrian is going to speak next. Great, thank you so much, um, Katie. This is gonna dovetail nicely into what uh, Katie was just talking about. Um, so I'm Adrian Masanari. I'm an associate professor of communication at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, so we often talk about how beneficial open science is for the communities we work with, um, engaging with these communities and seeing them as co-participants in knowledge creation. Um, this is great and it also helps us remain aware of the power imbalance that, you know, still exists between researchers and the researched or our participants. Um, and, you know, this is particularly true and I think for most of us coming from a feminist or social justice or indigenous perspective, uh, there's very much a, a, a desire to uh, equalize um, that, uh, that, you know, the power and difference that exists. Um, but in my work, so I'm interested in sort of gender-based harassment campaigns and what's been termed the alt-right here in the U.S. Um, and this mirrors sort of far-right activism and kinds of harassment campaigns we've seen globally. Um, and I'm specifically, my work is interested in the ways in which um, spaces and platforms like Reddit, um, the design and politics of those places provide sort of a fertile space for these extremist ideologies to take hold and become mainstream. 
Um, and then how groups themselves are using those same tools that we um, praise for democratic activism around the world um, to also harass and create these targeted campaigns of harassment. So, I mean, I guess my question is, how does open science look? What does this mean, open communication, when you're researching anti-feminist activism online or racist hate groups or incels, so involuntary celibates or people, if we're trying to understand a space like um, Reddit's subreddit, The Donald, uh, how do we get to that and how do we do open science and is it even possible? Um, I think that these spaces, and this is important, important for us to, to think about is that, you know, this relationship between the researcher and participant is changing. And in part, social media is a big reason why that is. Um, there's now this, you know, increasing uh, desire and also pressure upon researchers to be public in certain ways on these platforms. Um, those same platforms conveniently also allow them to become potential targets. Um, and we know that increasingly that there's this, um, we see this happening uh, in, in part because of uh, events like Gamergate. So the 2014 campaign of harassment of mostly against uh, women journalists, uh, game critics, feminist uh, critics, uh, and others, developers, game developers on Twitter. Um, you know, we see these kinds of campaigns and I think for most of us who are aware of this, um, even sort of tangentially um, become concerned for our own potential safety uh, when thinking about how do we how do we study these groups that actually are really critical to understand um, and to think about how we can sort of de-radicalize them um, by remaining still keeping some sense of uh, you know our own safety um, in mind and we have to also acknowledge that academic researchers in all kinds of fields beyond just communication um, obviously are being put at risk because of a general distrust of what science and expertise means. I mean, this is particularly relevant to those of us in the U.S., but it's not just the U.S. that this is happening. Um, but in particular, communication, given the kinds of questions we're interested in asking um, and the populations we tend to work with are especially at risk, I would argue. Um, and so what we have to consider, and something that I've turned the alt-rights gaze, um, I have an article in the Social Media Society about this, um, that I sort of talk about the ways in which this, this sort of roving, if you can imagine a spotlight that may shine upon us at any moment, puts us at great risk, um, making sure that we're separated from our networks of um, you know, support um, and potentially threaten us and our families and colleagues and research participants um, in other studies that we may be working on. This increasing pressure to be open about the ways, uh, about our work, um, may not always be beneficial to ourselves, and <laughs> that's my argument, and to, the, in general, the populations we're working with um, that I think a lot of us want to give voice to marginalized populations and allow that to be the forefront of the work that we do, we might be putting them at great risk um, in, in other, you know, in certain cases by this pressure to be open. Um, this not only includes pressure from sort of the public, the departments that we're working in, and our field to think about publishing in open access journals or offering preprints or blog about our work or talk about it with journalists. These all things seem great on the surface. And I think that they can be really powerful tools for um, making sure that we have some sort of public engagement with our work. But there is this downside of potential harassment. And I would most importantly, it's thinking about who is specifically going to be the target of harassment. It's most often times the people who are already marginalized in some way. So, you know, Black, Indigenous, people of color, LGBTQIA plus communities, those who are non-tenured or in precarious position, um, students, um, lots of different possible groups that are actually already marginalized in some ways are typically the ones who are on the receiving end of this kind of harassment. And that was certainly the case with Gamergate. Um, and those of us who are also doing work within that's more qualitatively oriented are also more likely to be targeted. Um, so there's this perception, I think, and I would argue wrongly, <laughs> of course, um, as a qualitative researcher, that qualitative research is soft or biased or political as if somehow quantitative work is not political. Um, but we know that this is the case, that this is oftentimes, um, you can see it on Twitter when someone who is a sociologist doing more ethnographic work or communication scholar doing that, the ways in which they're targeted differently 
um, depending on the kind of work that they do is perceived as non-scholarly or non-scientific. So I have some thoughts and sort of questions to pose about this sort of larger question about where's the researcher in open science? What does this idea of risk mean, researcher risk um, mean for us thinking about this as we move forward? Um, and so a couple of suggestions here, and I'd be happy to talk more about this during the Q&A um, and our discussion. Um, so for individual researchers, I mean, clearly this kind of event like Gamergate um, means that we're going to have to start adding a step of risk assessment to our research um, that moves beyond just the participant risk. Um, it moves towards our own selves. Um, so that means a frank assessment of the risks we're taking given a research topic, our approach, our own social location, our relative presence or absence on social media. Um, and the potential threats that the specific population we may be studying, so for example, uh, or working with, um, so if we're studying the alt-right or um, if we're studying communities like, you know, activist groups like Gamergate, what does that mean for us specifically? We have to be very frank about the risks that this potentially poses, And it also means, unfortunately, having some very difficult conversations about the risks that our workplace um, creates for others. So our family, our friends, our communities, our students, our institutions. Um, we also need to be incredibly aware of what our students are doing because I'm increasingly seeing a lot of students who are really interested in this kind of work. Um, and that's great, um, but also they're at incredible risk because they're students, because they're in positions where they're in more precarious positions. Um, so, and there's a lot that can be done um, you know, you could basically, you could ruin someone's reputation in terms of ever getting a job very easily. Um, if you're a student without the institutional support and you're doing this kind of work, it would be very easy for someone to um, be put at great risk. Departments and universities also need to have a very clear plan of coordination. And I'm saying this as knowing that this is not happening. <laughs> this hasn't happened yet, um, but this is sort of looking forward that articulates how are they going to support researchers if they're targeted. So that includes everything from like the very basic like locking down accounts to potentially removing location information uh, about offices and things like that. Um, big data, uh, the date, sorry, Data and Society has a really excellent report about this um, that I can provide more information that they sort of outline some of those, um, those efforts that could be made by um, departments and universities. Um, you know, institutional review boards and ethics committees, administrators and university lawyers should care about all this, but unfortunately they probably won't <laughs> um, until they're actually faced with a case of this on their campus. Um, but it's going to be important for them as well to start considering how this research risk creates more liability for the university and has secondary effects like dissuading individuals from doing important research because it's too risky. Um, and also tenure and promotion guidelines need to be revised to, being, to reflect that being public about one's work or doing open science isn't always possible or desirable, um, depending on what you're working with. I mean, as a field, and I think this is the kind of stuff that I hope we get to talk about further um, in both the chat that we have, but also um, asynchronously with all of you, thinking about how do we create networks of support around this? Um, there's been a lot of people who are individually working in these really difficult situations and with difficult communities. Um, and part of what makes harassment, this kind of harassment scary and intolerable is that it singles you out, right? So you don't feel like you have any support. Um, and that needs to change. I mean, we need to be having more conversations about the, these, if people are gonna be doing this kind of work, how do we support them as a field? Um, and also, if we think about it, you know, we know that this is, maybe that we have to take some critical hard steps um, as a field to think about what, what kinds of um, research might be something that are better tackled later on in one's career if you're, you know, if you have the privilege of having a tenured track or tenured position um, and thinking really strategically about how do we advocate for this sort of open science and open communication without putting under um, folks in undue, uh, under undue risk. Um, the other thing is I think we need to think about, and this is something that's already happening, but thinking more about this sort of ethical frameworks that move simply beyond what is offered, of course, by our IRBs or ethics committees um, for how we go forward with this kind of work. Um, I personally think ethics of care is possibly one of those, but thinking about how do we include the researcher 
assessment of researcher risk in this kind of murky area that we're working with, um, and how do we best support that? And thirdly, I think, and very importantly, is how do we push back on standards of excellence in our field that often hold this sort of solo author, non-anonymous, very public scholarship as a desirable outcome? Are there ways of thinking creatively about publication? Perhaps publication happens more anonymously. Perhaps publication might be done with a network or a group and thinking about the ways in which that does not become, that doesn't, that's not seen as a deficit to someone's, um, you know, tenure promotion uh, package, but is also seen as a real, uh, it, it reflects very a situated and contextual understanding of who they are, the kinds of populations they work with, and the real risks that um, might be involved. Um, and with that, I will turn it over. Thank you. All right, next up is Lucas. Hello, everyone. My name is Lucas Schultz, and I'm assistant professor at the University of Sheffield in the UK. And I would like to talk about those issues related to open science, uh, to think about it with my project, which is about Polish LGBTQs in the UK. And it was a project about their migration experiences, about their gender sexual identity, as well as the use of social media. And this project, uh, it was my postdoc project, and I conducted it at London School of Economics and was funded by the European Union. And at the very beginning, European Union asked me if I would like to make my data open. And then I opted out. So now I'll tell you a little bit about my, what, my, my thinking process, what I was thinking about possible advantages and possible disadvantages of making my data open. But what kind of data I had, so I had a survey, online survey, and then I had in-depth interviews with 30 LGBTQs, Polish LGBTQs in the UK. So I think maybe with surveys is a little bit less complicated, maybe it depends on survey, but for me, I will focus now on this kind of qualitative data. So for me, I was basically thinking about making open my transcripts, interview transcripts with my participants. So let me start with some maybe possible advantages of that. So I was thinking, I think it's somebody else already mentioned, we work with marginalized communities and very often those voices are not being heard. And I thought giving this data set to somebody else and maybe somebody else conduct a secondary analysis of those data and publish on that, or some journalists or artists uh, take it on and publish something on that, I thought that as an advantage, as kind of promoting maybe more perspectives of marginalized uh, communities and, and to understand better the world through perspective on, of minoritarian uh, subjects. Another thing I was thinking about is, uh, again, we can also get more insights about those communities, uh, particularly about Polish LGBTQs in the UK. There's almost non research about Polish LGBTQs in the UK, while there's plenty of research about Polish migration in the UK. It was huge after 2004 when Poland joined the UK. Uh, sorry, not the UK, when Poland joined the European Union. And um, so there's plenty of research there. And I was reading this re recent, there was nothing about sexuality. And, and I thought this, that it does matter on many different levels. And I think kind of giving people access to that data, even just to compare uh, with your maybe other research, maybe not focused particularly on LGBTQs, I thought about it maybe a little bit ideal, uh, in an ideal world, uh, as a kind of mainstreaming a little bit of, of marginalized research, because I also feel that there are spaces in science for this kind of work for research with marginalized communities, but very often we just put into those boxes. They are there, they're conducting their research with marginalized groups, but they are not talking about those big issues that we or communication scholars are talking about. So I think there was some potential there. Now, I told you that I decided to opt out, and uh, so I decided not to share my uh, interview transcripts. Now, why? I think for me, the biggest issue was, that was already mentioned, uh, anonymity and, and, and to make sure that all the data are con uh, confidential. And you know, think about it, that it's 30 in-depth interviews 
each interview was about two hours. And of course, I would anonymize that. Uh, but then, how do you anonymize that? There's so many rich information there about people for two hours of interview that it would take me really a lot of time to think about all the possible ways that people could actually identify a person. And uh, as and marginalized communities very often are also easier to identify. If you know there's a migrant who is LGBTQ, or even more specifically, a transgender woman who is in that area, who is doing this kind of job, and you know, this kind of information are being kind of combined, especially in such a long interview. So then I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I think it would take me a lot of time, so it's super time consuming. I wouldn't be sure at the very end if actually I, I did a good job that it's actually not possible to identify those people. And, and there's no incentive really to do that. Also what other people were mentioning. Why should I spend so much time trying those other possible ways people could identify my participants when it's, it's better to write another article based on, based on that research for kind of career wise, right? So that was for me the biggest problem. But there were also some other problems. Uh, another problem was, uh, was, I think Cheryl was mentioning, taking it out of context. I was thinking, okay, I can put this research there. I'm happy that other researchers are looking into that data. But if they don't know the context, if they don't know the geopolitical situation in the UK and Poland, if they don't, don't know the migration motivations and stories there, I mean, what would be your interpretation and I'm not saying it would be worse, um, but I think I'll be a little bit of afraid of, uh, of kind of misinterpreting some, some of those, those issues and taking it totally out of the context and just use it, analyze it without having much knowledge about, about the topic. And here I also agree with some other participants here mentioning access, open access to whom? Because now I was talking mostly about the researchers. Okay, researcher and other researchers um, have access to my data set. Maybe they don't know the context, but they still want to do a good job and want to come up with some ideas. What about some homophobic journalists having access to that? And in Poland, since 2015, we have very homophobic government and they took over the public broadcaster and they are very homophobic pub, um, public uh, media as well now. And they run so many homophobic stories, picking, you know, like the, the, the good example is always the pride parades when they always pick up the most extreme, even what does that mean? But anyway, they, they, they take this kind of most extreme case, show them the TV and say, and say this is who queers are. And, they, and I, I would be afraid that they could do the same thing with my research. Take some quotes out of context and again, quote it, oh, you see, this is what they mean. Those Polish queers in the UK, they don't really like Poland. They're really not patriotic or whatever. While, for example, my participants were criticizing Poland because of its homophobic attitude, mostly about the current government. Um, so I also was thinking about, okay, but in which situation maybe we could have an access or could give access to those data. So I was thinking maybe there would be a system that I put those kind of data there, but it's not available, but it's just listed there. And then I can authorize every time somebody asks me if they want to, so they can like kind of apply for access to my data. And then maybe I could go through that and say, yes, you have an access or you don't have an access. That would be one way that I could potentially think. There are some problems with it, with it as well, of course, but I, I'm trying to be creative now and thinking about these different solutions here. Uh, another thing I was thinking, like, if, if it's a researcher, if somebody is doing, let's say, secondary analysis of my data, I think it would be nice if I have, uh, if I could be a reviewer for that article. Because then I can check the context, because I understood the context. So the original researcher, also not always possible, but maybe we should try at least to include the original researchers as a, one of the reviewers, as a kind of, again, checking if those data were not used out too much out of the context. And possibly also when listing those data or giving access to the data, we could also provide some additional information, 
So like a note about the context, what's important, what's not important. Again, a lot of problems with that, but I'm thinking about some solutions to this kind of problem of taking the data out of the context. And the final thing I want to mention, one problem that was also, I think, uh, touched uh, upon a little bit in our previous conversation would be consent. And I think in a lot of qualitative research and research, maybe a lot more like cultur cultural and critical research, at least the con consent is un understood as a process. And I think consent is for me as a process. It's not just one thing that I give a document to my, research, to my participants, they sign it and then I'm free to do with the data whatever I want. I also try to be very specific. So in my research, I actually ask participants, I told participants specifically what I will be publishing from that research. So I told them about, uh, about academic uh, articles. I told them about, about blog posts. I told them that I plan to talk to mainstream media about it and that I want to possibly write a popular science book about it. So they could take different aspects if they agree to that or not. Uh, but I didn't include any artist, for example. So like if, if putting the, 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 all the data there and everybody can use it, I think that could be one of the problem. And again, maybe that's also, uh, could be a way for us to gain control over, over this kind of access to data. So yes, giving access to, to data to some people, but not to all of them. And also for some publications, but not all kinds of publications. So maybe you could mention also sh sharing your data set saying the participants agreed to share this, con this, this information uh, in that kind of form, but, and that's it. So you cannot do anything beyond that. O of course, how specific or how general that should be, it's also complicated. And I think it doesn't solve all the problems because as I said, thinking about consent as a process, sometimes, I, in one case, I actually asked one participant, telling to them, okay, I have this quote from you. It was a very interesting case of a former priest who is now, who is now not a priest anymore, and he's a gay identified person in the UK. And there was a lot of specific stories about him. So I said, okay, nobody who doesn't know you won't be able to identify you. And identify you. But if your parents read that, or if any parent, people from your family read that, they will be able to identify you. And I asked him, will you be still okay to put me this kind of quote in the official report for my research? And then he said, yes. So it, again, like this thing that I asked after I, he actually signed the consent form. And that's my kind of brings me to my last point that this is a bit more complicated point, I think, is the question of who should we allow to take risk? in a sense, because sometimes we just want to protect our, our participants, but especially working with LGBTQ populations who traditionally were made invisible and were fighting for visibility, very often they want to be visible. And I had some cases of participants or some organizations I was working with in some previous project, they were, they were, tell, uh, they were telling me, no, Lucas, we want, we want you to use our name because we are proud of that. And you, you shouldn't make us invis invisible like other people make us invisible, or as if we are ashamed of what we are, we are saying. And I was like, yes, but I also see what's happening there. And I also see how the government can use it against you. And then what shall I do? Like, should I have the final word saying, no, I don't allow you to take that risk because I see that the risk is high or just inform them as much as I can and say, if you want to take that risk, Maybe I should give this agency to my participant and say, yes, if you want to take that risk, maybe we should allow them to take this risk as well. It's not easy uh, answer, uh, question to answer, I think, but it's one of the cases that I also uh, come across in my research. So I'll stop here and uh, I'm happy to continue the discussions later on. Okay, thanks, Lucas. Okay, last but not least is Jesse. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jesse Fox. I'm in the School of Communication at Ohio State. Um, and to give a little bit on my background and relevance in this area, I've been studying uh, gender identity, queer identity, ethno-racial minorities in the US and intersectional identities. And I also use both quantitative and qualitative methods in my research. So those are what's framing kind of my approach to this. 
And in my comments here, I'm going to try to synthesize uh, what other people have said as I work along and kind of see this as a unifying uh, this, this panel and its comments. So first point that I'd like to make is that we as scholars need to be mindful that in an open science world, we do not understand identifiability. This is a imprecise uh, approach and people, there are no standards, there are no particular explicit guidelines that we can follow. Um, there could be some advisement in that area, but we are not really clear and sure about what's identifiable. And people can be very sloppy with their data because of that. They don't even consider this as a factor. Uh, recently, I was involved in a conversation with Dr. Rao Zhang, um, who was able to identify 130 data sets on Dataverse that had um, the, you know, the location data attached to them. Um, so that's showing that people aren't even removing kind of default things like IP addresses and uh, location data from data sets before uploading them and sharing them with the world, which is a problem. Um, Jessica pointed out many ways that even the methods we use independent of the data can increase identifiability. So, you know, using public computers and so forth uh, can also be kind of an element that's factored into that beyond what we're actually the content of the data that's coming out. Uh, Lucas had noted that certain people based on a particular minority or intersectional identity can be recognized within a certain sample, uh, even just solely on their demographic information, just something like their queer identity, knowing that they are a, a Polish immigrant, um, and their age, for example, might be able to, enough to be able to pick someone out in a study. Um, in my personal work, I've had lots of stories of coming out on social media, uh, incidents of feeling marginalized in educational settings and in my qualitative research, you know, these are very detailed explanations of kind of a situation that if anyone else was participant or witness to that, they would recognize probably what happened there. So um, lived experiences can be very difficult to de-identify and at the point where you do kind of remove enough of that information, it's, you know, not really even conveying the whole story, which can be problematic. A second point is that we do not understand the other affordances associated with open practices and that these are constantly shifting. Uh, so a lot of our research in marginalized areas is guided by this ongoing tension because as scholars, I think most of us would agree that we're trying to elevate the voices of vulnerable and marginalized populations and you know, draw attention to the struggles and difficulties associated with that. Uh, however, you know, we, we are obligated to kind of protect privacy and ensure that we are not increasing their risks. And in many of the practices that people use in communication research, they may be increasing visibility and decreasing privacy. They may be increasing searchability. Uh, they may be increasing the persistence of this information that was kind of maybe transmitted in a more ephemeral way or taking away their power to remove or delete it when we do something like uh, collect or create a data set and post that on the internet. Uh, you know, Lucas pointed out, well, maybe people want that visibility, but if they decide later they don't, it's outside of their control to kind of remove that. And we have to think about what that means because political tides can change, people's own perspectives and experiences change. And, you know, we may be granting them agency in that moment, but with persistence of data sets, we would be taking that agency and that decision-making power away. Uh, you know, people argue that social media posts are public, but uh, I think Adrian used the metaphor of a spotlight and uh, on scholarship and also, you know, we're putting a spotlight on those people when we are creating these persistent and searchable data sets. We're putting a spotlight and a microphone in front of them when they may not have asked for that. Um, and we're creating, again, persistence that wasn't there before necessarily. Um, and as Philippa notes, this, this violates trust, particularly among marginalized populations that, you know, readily and often experience, you know, objectification and violation. Um, and so we have to be thoughtful about the ways that we can hopefully avoid doing that. And uh, several people pointed out that this may make them less willing to participate in online discourse. This may make them less likely to perform necessary actions online and it may make them distrustful of science in general. And, you know, what we've seen every day right now, we see what distrust in science uh, has gotten us. 
So uh, as Katie pointed out, and I really like this phrase, you know, we as scholars don't want to be part of a culture of fear and we do not want to be the people who are perpetuating harm. Um, Adrian also pointed out that these same affordances can make scholars themselves more vulnerable. And you know, there are there have been situations where we've had organizing campaign organize campaigns against communication scholars um, who are, and it's because they do certain areas of research and because they are elevating the voices of marginalized and vulnerable people. And open science practices may be beneficial, but could also put again a spotlight on, on those scholars as well. A uh, third point is that we cannot predict the future. Uh, you know, many people, Cheryl and Katie and Lucas, uh, pointed out some specific examples of motivated bad actors who can take advantage of um, open data or identifiable data. Um, and Adrian also pointed out that as scholars, we may be targeted. So uh, I guarantee the people whose data sets will be most closely scrutinized are the people who have uh, traditionally been targeted in online environments. And we can expect that, again, that becomes itself a marginalizing force because those of us, I have received many, many, you know, death threats over email and social media and uh, because of my work in areas of, of gender. And uh, this is creating not only more labor, but emotional labor for these scholars when they must force, they must be forced to open themselves up to this sort of thing that other people do not necessarily experience. Uh, Katie and Filippo both pointed out too that we cannot anticipate the future in terms of what technologies will bring us in terms of increased searchability. Uh, already there are people whose work is centered around uh, individualizing geolocation data, finding patterns of movement in virtual environments and eye tracking and recognizable uh, linguistic patterns. Uh, there are people, researchers, who are trying to link uh, anonymous profiles across different social media and you know, if, if we're creating those data sets and giving them more material to work with, then you know, we could be contributing to that problem. So we have to be mindful in the ways that open science practices may seem okay now, um, but could be used not only by bad parties, but also in the future uh, in ways that we have not foreseen. Uh, my last point that I'd like to make before I give us some take home points is that an inflexible approach uh, is, is going to discourage certain types of research and it will in, in essence be a marginalizing force because not all types of data are the same, not all data are the same. Um, to quote Adrian, this is not always possible nor desirable. Um, so there are certain methods and topics that are going to be inherently uh, marginalized by this process. Um, inductive research, we can't predict where this is going. There's nothing I can really register to tell you because the point that I'm doing that, I'm already kind of shaping my research process in a way that may be undesirable. Um, and qualitative research you know, tends to take an inductive approach. Uh, research on marginalization, uh, marginalized population, again, because of scholars' desire to protect those populations and maintain privacy, that can be uh, problematic because then, again, that work would be more marginalized if people coming and doing that research feel more of a need to protect data and, and not be open with that. And we could have scholars who feel that they have to, you know, that are conscientious objectors to putting data that could be harmful out there could then be, you know, excluded from publishing in certain journals or could be, uh, this could work against them on the tenure track and we have to be thoughtful about that. So I like having to do lists. So here are kind of five things that you can do as a scholar. And first thing is that remembering that openness starts with your conversations with participants. And that's in the consent process. That's the moment that you start, you know, considering the risks and being very explicit about what you're doing with your data. Um, I see, I have seen consent forms that it's like, oh, these might be shared with other scientists. Well, that doesn't say I'm going to take your data and post on the internet and anyone can use it. So whatever you're doing, you need to be extremely clear about that and need to make sure that your participants understand the implications of that. I like Lucas's metaphor. What if your parents saw this? You know, uh, would they be able to identify you or know this? And is that a problem? Um, second, I'd like to shift away. I encourage people, don't use the term anonymity um, you, because that just seems very dichotomous. It's either your name's on it or your name's not on it. So let's shift our thinking in, about, you know, a kind of a bigger spectrum of identifiability. Um, and also anonymity makes it sound kind of inherently un, like you can't figure out who it is. And identifiable is really focusing on the you are known. And then we're kind of taking properties away to make you less known as opposed to assuming that something is inherently anonymous um, and then thinking away from that. So I think this gradient can really help us 
frame our thinking. Um, Adrian pointed out before we started, word choice is important. So uh, I like to think about that too. Uh, third is a lot of people just defer and say, well, you know, my IRB approved it, my ethics review board approved it. Um, but you have to keep in mind that particular to your issue or your topic, uh, they may not be experts. They may not understand that. I, I am a vice chair of an IRB and I guarantee you uh, most of my board members are, are less technically, uh, technologically um, apt or adept than people on average are in the field of communication. And, you know, like Cheryl had brought up these very specific and distinct things. Like if you have that knowledge, then that's, you know, think about participating as a board member on your IRB, I might add. Um, but we need to have open conversations with community members and other experts in our field to get a grasp on what these risks look like. Um, so, and, and to Lucas's point, you know, it's, it's hard about that agency, but we also may have more expertise in an area um, like privacy that we must also share that information with our participants. Um, point number four is data. It's people. Data is made out of people. And it's our ethical obligation to put people first. And finally, as communication scholars, you know, let's listen to each other in this conversation around open science. Let's trust others' expertise um, when we're talking about things like the benefits and drawbacks of open science, particular open science practices. Uh, a lot of the framing of open science is born out of distrust, that we do not trust each other. Um, and that's why we have to like look over everyone's data. And this was born out of, you know, bad, bad things that happened that made people feel a need to scrutinize this more closely, um, which of course is important, but let's also make sure to listen and, and trust people when they tell us that there are things in their data, um, perhaps that are not sharing worthy or that could elevate risk in that sense. So that's all I have. Thanks, Jesse. That was fantastic to summarize. Uh, Everything and I, I appreciate greatly your to-do list. Um, so we're going to turn to a discussion, and um, I, the the first thing that I'd love for us to talk about, um, looking at the reviews for this panel, um, a number of our reviewers brought up, you know, well, why would data sharing in particular be problematic if data were anonymized? or as we in this panel probably agree, it did, uh, that identifiability is lessened. Um, so Lucas already brought up, you know, the hours he could hypothetically spend uh, redacting. I'm like envisioning this like paper with like everything blacked out, basically. The hours he could spend uh, decreasing identifiability in his data set, which, you know, I imagine that the result might even be pointless you know, once it was entirely cleaned up. But I'd love to pose to the group, speaking directly to uh, reviewer comments for this panel, could you imagine some sort of document that you would feel comfortable uploading, maybe having elements that, you know, later could be changed as the um, identifiability uh, environment changes? Could it even be possible? And what would that look like in your, Estimation. So if you want to raise your hand and then speak to what you think might even be possible um, would be great. All right, I saw Falou. Okay, um, thanks for that. And, and you know, I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody else has to say, but um, I think that's a really good point. I think, uh, you know, the trade-off between time spent on this versus what are you going to get uh, and have out at the end of it is any easier for another researcher just to do another interview, maybe that. Uh, would take uh, even even less time, uh, but I, I think what needs to you know I can envisage maybe that type of system, uh, provided again that the times make makes it worthwhile. But the risk there I think has to do with distortion and what would be left out. And so I think for that kind of approach to work, really you should have um, collaboration from the participant themselves. Right, but that's kind of again putting onus on them to invest time in reviewing the transcript and deciding what they feel comfortable with sharing um, in this different setting, whether it's going to be open to everybody or uh, again, I really like this idea earlier on, you know, the researcher having control and people may be applying to use that data. 
uh, but we have to kind of contend with all of these different responsibilities and uh, you know time consuming practices uh, and it, it's not just about logistics it's about putting people in control of what they think is going uh, to be potentially um, you know put, put them at risk uh, and, and what um, and how to balance that versus uh, you know making sure whatever is shared out of what they said in a research context remains meaningful uh, and can be interpreted uh, correctly and so on and that goes back to um, you know, like uh, Jesse's point at the end your third to do this idea of you know don't assume that just because it's been approved uh, you know those who uh, uh, approved it really had the full picture and uh, this is a place maybe to have more input from uh, if not directly the participants but experts within the community uh, and people who have that life experience and kind of using them as a sounding board as to what the potential risks could be uh, going forward uh, if this were to be shared in a more uh, kind of open way with uh, outside of uh, the original research team and so on. But I'm interested in hearing what the other ones uh, have to say. All right, Adrian. So to add to that, um, I just want to um, say that I think that part of this is, I, I struggle with is like the decontextualization issue, right? So like moving out, I mean, for those of us who, I see our work as being highly situated, enjoy the situated contextual nature, especially if you're into doing qualitative work and that's sort of what, you, you know, uh, where you, you, where your passion is <laughs> to sort of see data like separate from that context is I think challenging, right? To think about like to envision this moment where you would be able to just throw field notes or to interview transcripts up on a website and say, all right, you go at it, go do something with it, even if, you know, assuming that they could be redacted in such a way that it's, but like what meaning is going to be made without all of the context and larger sort of situational stuff that as a researcher, you know, that you bring to that space. Um, and so I guess my concern is, I don't think it's impossible, but I think when we start talking about it's certainly a lot easier in a way uh, to look at social media posts and just be like, well, we just scraped a bunch of public social media posts and put them in this database and then here, have at them. Like I can envision that perhaps a way of that happening. I'm, I'm sort of struggling with, and I have struggled with the, the ways in which the context might be lost um, in, in particular with, you know, I'm thinking about interview data or other kinds of forms of data. Um, and so I think we have to really, you know, consider that not all data looks the same, right? Like not all, there's been discussions, I think at one point there were discussions about field notes being publicized, if you, depending on your funding agency that you have. So in the U.S., I think there was some discussion if you were NSF funded, would your, you know, field note data be required? I'm thinking my own field notes. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there that I don't really want <laughs> I don't want to publicize for lots of reasons. And, and there's things that I would feel incredibly uncomfortable having sort of in a, in a sort of, you know, owned by a government agency or being publicized in a particular way. So I think that, again, we have to really query, like, what is it that, what's the purpose that we're looking for, for making data public, but also what data are we talking about here? You know, what is, what is meaningful? And when we strip out context, we know that that's where a lot of the issues kind of happen. Okay, hey, VTAC. Briefly, I just want to talk about differential privacy, which when we think about de-identification of data, I think it's easier with quantitative data than qualitative data. And it's actually still really challenging with quantitative data. And the main approach that's been embraced by a lot of big technologies, Facebook, Apple, Google, those types, in terms of trying to protect individual privacy is something called differential privacy, which is basically a mathematical approach to privacy whereby you introduce noise into the data sets, into a small amount of the data set to try to obscure a person's identity. That noise is going to kind of break up some of the things that might identify them. Um, and there was last year uh, an attempt to release a lot of um, data from Facebook that 
actually didn't happen because they couldn't get this differential privacy approach to work sufficiently to where they felt that uh, you wouldn't be able to identify individuals from that data set. So when we think about qualitative data and the richness and the steps that it would take to obscure identity and still retain that you know, contextual uh, richness and all of these things that others, oh, I just, I am, I am kind of skeptical that we would be able to widely share this um, type of data and ensure that we're minimizing risk over time to participants. So it's, uh, these are all really great points and I hope that if the reviewers are watching that this helps address some of those questions about how incredibly difficult it is. And as Jesse pointed out earlier, that um, there is, it's known that, that even within quantitative data, that there's sloppiness and that, as Vitek just pointed out, that, you know, it still is incredibly difficult to do so. So if it's incredibly difficult to do so with quantitative data, how could we possibly do this with qualitative data? Um, with that, with that being acknowledged, does anyone on the panel have a have an experience where qualitative data were shared, whether it be on some open repository or shared with other researchers that worked? And um, and if so, can you explain a little bit about how that process worked? Anyone? Anyone? Um, I guess off the top of my head, I could imagine, you know, you have a, a master's student who cannot collect original data for whatever reason, and that you're working closely with them to provide the context that the interviews were originally collected in, that you're working with that graduate student to ensure that they are um, understanding of the literature that helped originally form the research questions that were then used um that that sort of collaboration could hypothetically be possible nods head shakes yeah go ahead Cheryl. well if ever it would be i i guess i'm going to take off from lucas's point earlier that question of who will be involved in the project will have to be planned from the very beginning not only because irb um reviews will require you and also um at a personal level you should think about um asking a person to sign consent implies autonomy and anticipation of what kinds of risks that data that you, you're getting um might impose upon your participant and assessing as much as possible all those risks and so um you'll have to be very careful about asking or anticipating from the very beginning who you will you will intend to share that data with and whether that person you know is someone you can trust in relation to the risks that you will anticipate at the very onset of obtaining consent so i can imagine it to be very very difficult um, um anticipating all the risks that it will that can take place especially for us working with marginalized populations who are already anticipating um not just existing or current risks but risks that might they might find themselves even five years from now or a few years from now if for example we share that data with someone and that someone shares that data with someone else and, and so on so. Yeah, Lucas. to briefly add to that i was also thinking about it like as I started talking about my research, I would love it some other researchers who are maybe also researching Polish queer population and know the know the context that they have access to that data as well. Or, or I'm also thinking about artists who would like to have an artistic project and going deeper into the data and go, going to know the the interviews that I conducted with with my researchers. But again, it was mentioned before, I think I would like to have some control over that. And then again, the, the asking participants if they are okay with, with that being published, maybe even showing them the final product that the other person is, is doing and saying, would you be comfortable with that being, I don't know, displayed in a gallery, for example. But as a principle, I think 
you know, I also would like, I, I conducted this research, I spent a lot of time, there was a lot of resources put into that. My participants participated into that because it's also kind of political for them. They also want to make this, uh, their perspective more visible in society at large. And very often when I ask them about those kind of questions, like going back to them after conducting research with them saying, is that okay to publish this quote from you? They said, yes, I, I gave you this interview because I hope that will be an extra small addition to maybe changing how our society think about it. So in a principle, I think a lot of uh, researchers, but also the participants would be kind of willing to kind of, again, bring those minoritarian perspectives to our society, but in a kind of more controlled situations for both the researchers and participants, I think that would be important. Jesse. I think uh, a lot of us are reflecting on this kind of in a, a data sharing way and almost with the lens that people would necessarily be reanalyzing our data. And so, you know, I think I just wanted to throw out there that, you know, there are other ways to consider open practices that, you know, for me, if, if, if my participants are, are comfortable with this and, you know, and in my opinion, the opinion of others who have done this research, it's, it's safe to have that data open. You know, I would certainly be willing to share that with people because people who are, you know, to Lucas's point, who are interested in this field or interested in the area, you know, reading through that stuff just might inspire them to have ideas. Um, it, it might teach them something uh, that would be valuable to them as scholars. So, you know, I think we, we should also, you know, keep in mind that open data doesn't necessarily mean now someone takes it and reanalyzes it and makes it their own without, you know, full understanding of it. It, it can have other purposes as well. And, and I think those are very valuable. And that's one thing that, you know, I really struggle with because I would really love for people who do my research to have, you know, those perspectives and that stuff to enrich their own uh, research and, and kind of pay that forward in that way. Uh, that said, it, it very early in doing this research, I realized I don't know that I could ever uh, do this research because there is also, we, we haven't talked about the deterrent of openness. And, I, you know, I've had people tell me that they would be killed in their home countries if they told, you know, the, their families the things that they've told me. And, you know, if, if I'm saying in my consent form or right there, like, yo, I'm going to advertise all your business or this is going to be posted on the internet for anyone to see, um, you know, we are driving away a certain proportion of people as well when we study these topics. And I think that that's also an ethical problem when we are essentially marginalizing the people who don't want their business to be open. And um, I think that should also be weighed in our decisions and that should be considered again another factor because inherently making, you know, diminishing someone's privacy is going to create uh, a sample bias and it's going to give us a less accurate picture and it's also going to essentially eliminate a lot of the most vulnerable people from that picture. Lisa. Just very briefly, uh, um, to build on, you know, some of what Jesse said as well and also what Charles said earlier on, it's, and I can maybe offer, uh, sort of a cautionary tale in a certain way. Katie was asking earlier on, have you ever had the experience of sharing this type of data uh, with someone else and so on? That made me think of the importance that um, I think educating funders uh, has uh, in relation to, you know, what they require uh, and how that is going to have an impact, as Jesse was saying, on what people are willing to share or even if people are willing to participate in this type of research or not. And if they do so, if they're going to, you know, really share what matters or they have, they're going to have reservations uh, about it. And it reminded me of, you know, this doesn't need to rise to the level of like federal funders that increasingly for certain studies require or even research councils in the UK, for example, uh, require uh, the open uh, sharing of some databases and so on. But it reminded me of a study I participated in years ago when I used to work in Scotland. We were doing a very in-depth interviews with people who had uh, financial issues out of the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 9, and uh, those financial issues were then, uh, you know, um, precipitated their health conditions. Uh, and they were having really, really health, um, 
difficult health problems. And uh, some of the funders of this research were, was a very large uh, social housing agency. Uh, and we were essentially interviewing some of their tenants. And, you know, at some point during the research process, uh, the housing uh, agency came to us uh, asking whether we would be willing to share some of the interview transcripts with them because they thought they could design better interventions to help, you know, people's housing situations out of it. And, you know, it was an obvious uh, no to us, but they just didn't understand because they were paying for some of this research, why wouldn't it have been appropriate uh, for us to share uh, some of this data? I mean, the circumstances of these people were so unique uh, and essentially we would have been giving the data to their landlord that there was nothing we could do uh, to de-identify uh, that data uh, because if they had shared it with, you know, say their, their liaison uh, officer on the ground in, in the apartment complex, they would have known right away who it is that was talking. Uh, just because of the experiences they were describing. And so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of, uh, you know, letting funders understand what the actual risks uh, of this may be. Uh, and, uh, you know, but at the same time, uh, how if we uh, don't take care of these risks, then this, some, some of these risks just can't happen. So, um Another question, another potential audience for this are journal editors. We know that increasingly there is interest or discussion of um, when people submit articles to a journal that they also um, submit links to supplementary materials. Uh, again, getting back to the topic of data sharing. But uh, one thing that I think about with this is that this may come in conflict with efforts within the field of communication at uh, having more inclusive research at internationalizing communication as a field, uh, thoughts about, you know, hashtag communication so white, hashtag communication uh, so North American, Western European, and that I could imagine that um, creating more potential barriers to people submitting in mainstream communication journals, it would go against that effort. Or those efforts. So, um, if if you all could speak to a journal editor that was considering engaging in uh, whether it be pre-registration of studies or um, data sharing associated with studies, what would you tell them? Just briefly, some points to consider. Anyone? Anyone? All right, thanks, Jesse. Um, I think uh, we have to be mindful that, you know, for a journal and for your audience that you're, this goes back to my previous point of marginalizing certain types of research, and you're going to be more likely to skew the research that is coming out when you do that. Um, in a way, you are marginalizing, again, qualitative research, I think, is more likely to be excluded from uh, you know, certain mandatory and inflexible practices. So we have to be mindful that we're, you know, not excluding that, that type of approach. And again, when people are trying, you know, I think this is going to continue to be an elevated concern for people studying marginalized and vulnerable populations. And so then as a journal editor, is, is that your goal is to exclude the voices and this type of research? Then that's, you know, I don't think that should be any journal editor's goal. So we really need to think more holistically about how this can be accomplished in, you know, flexible ways of kind of accommodating things and considerations of situations where, you know, open practices are just not possible or not ethical or not advisable. And, you know, secondarily, I think, too, we have to consider how what this means in terms of the careers for scholars. So if ICA flagships all of a sudden said, everybody has to do open science, period, that's the way we're rolling out, or if the editor of a flagship came out and demanded this, then, you know, some people work at institutions where this is part of their, you know, ability to get tenure. And when we change guidelines, that could, again, marginalize scholars themselves from, you know, making advancements in their careers and keeping the voices and keeping those people active in research. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of ways in which I think we have to be very, very careful uh, in making anything mandatory or having any 
particular set of checklist or rules apply to all forms of research in all situations. Yes, please, Cheryl. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Jesse. Um, and also, I guess, kind of in a broader sense, if this were to be required by journals or encouraged by journals, um, this has to go hand in hand with kind of a commitment that people who are sharing data um, of their research are kind of uh, actively considering ethical guidelines in relation to, I don't know, um, all the kinds of populations that they're studying, and particularly if they're doing research on marginalized populations. Um, we were discussing this before going on recording uh, in relation to how communication, how this is, needs to be, perhaps this conversation needs to be boosted um, in communication research. So in AIR, in Association of Internet Researchers, this is already incorporated in Internet Ethics 3.0, like, albeit only for artificial intelligence research still. Right, so it's spelled out that every researcher should be asking important questions in relation to the implications to their data subjects when they put in their data online or to, to the public, for example. And I wonder how, to what extent um, journals are in fact asking this of people who submit the data um, in, um, together with the, with the articles that they, they would submit. I have one quick addition to that in just that I do not understand at all why we are requesting data sets and we are not requesting consent forms. I wanna know what participants were told and as a reviewer, I think I have the right to see what they were told and determine whether or not that scholar has essentially the, the right to, to publicize that because, uh, you know, again, this is me being an IRB person, but I think that there are, and when I've asked, I've sent some inquiries to people and I have yet to get a response. Um, when I've asked, I'm curious, you know, how did you phrase your consent form? Because I'm looking for examples of ways that we could advise uh, scholars at our institution to, to word things in their consent form to be clear about this. And looking for sample wording, uh, it's almost impossible to find. And so I have a feeling that this is pretty widespread, that um, people are not fully informing their uh, participants what they are doing with their data. And I find that deeply problematic. And I think that the easiest way to do this is if these journals are, again, enabling uh, the submission of data that they should also require and also post with the data set uh, what the consent form looks like. That's a really good point. Uh, Lucas and then Felipe. Very short point. I agree with everything here. I particularly agree that it shouldn't be zero one issue. So it shouldn't be, you have to do it or you can do it. Or if you do it, you do it just this way, you, you release all the data. Or, or, or none of them. So I think it should be, if it's allowed, it should be very flexible. I'm thinking about, again, some advantages for qualitative researchers, maybe some longer quotes. Again, not entire interview uh, with my participants, there were two hours, but some longer quotes, I sometimes would love to give a lot of bit voice to my, uh, to my uh, participants in my article, which are usually short. I have to write the methodology, I have to always engage with the theory and the literature, so there's not always space for giving voice to the participants. So maybe this kind of more flexibility there. Uh, but I also like uh, Jesse's point before about the trust as well. Like, wh why should we come from this point that we, by default, don't trust each other? That other scientists are just trying to, to deceive us. And you know, there's some good practices, of course, how we write about our methodologies, uh, what kind of information we should include there. Uh, and I'm not saying that we should just trust everybody, whatever they, they write, but I think maybe coming from this more kind of ethics of care as well and kind of trying thinking about this kind of, you know, trying to, to imagine ourselves as a community of trustful scholars rather than, than just competing scholars and, and scholars who try to deceive each other. It's also a good starting point. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I agree with all that has been said. And I would add, uh, again, maybe building on Jesse's point from earlier, uh, you know, one thing I would ask an editor is, oh, why do you want me to share? Is that like, what's the purpose? You know, what's, what, what are we trying to get out of this? And is this the only way? Or is this the best way? Or should we have a range of options? 
uh, and you know, let's try to be creative about this. It's not just all or nothing, uh, as others have said, uh, and um, and so on. Because I think there is a risk of just you know going with the mantra, and, and because we think it's a good thing to do, or it should be done, and it creating it, it is going to help to create new knowledge. Then this is the only the only approach, kind of open sharing and so on. But there might be a range of options that maybe we're not considering so effectively you know going with the flow in that case would actually be limiting uh the, the creativity that this process might uh entail uh, that maybe we're not recognizing at the moment and so uh, you know thinking about uh, purpose i think it's just really really important and can open up a, a, a range of ways uh to consider uh ways of doing this um so this has all been really interesting and i hope that um we can continue having this conversation in the comments or whatever this is going to look like in the virtual format uh but i wanted to uh ask if anyone had anything that they felt wasn't touched upon that they felt would is important to consider in this conversation or if you have anything that you would like to potentially direct the audience to be thinking about or engaging with the on. So I just want to open that up. Anyone? Any other questions to address? Oh, yes, Lucas, please go ahead. Very, very briefly, but I, I, when I heard this call for open science, I immediately also thought about open access and publishing. And I think this is like the first, maybe the first step to actually think about it. And kind of maybe media and communications is not in that horrible position because ICA, so association is actually owning most of the high ranked journals and a lot of, and some of them are also, also actually open access. But I think there's also something hypocritical about it, kind of saying, yes, let's share the data, let's share the data. And then most of our, work which actually we are happy to share because in a published form not all of, not all of it as as you katie mentioned some cases but i think most of us i would be very happy to share it uh, and then it still uh, stays a paywall so i think there's also this discussions about what is actually the open access and open science in relation between those two that's a great point um anyone else anything to add well, in that case, uh, this was a great panel. It was uh, great virtually getting together with everyone. Uh, we really look forward to engaging with people in the comments, especially people that um, are doing this kind of work, having more of a community around people that are asking these questions or having these concerns is fantastic. And so, um, you know, if you wanna make yourself known and want to talk more with the people that are on this panel, that would be wonderful, or people that are uh, working within open science and have some uh, things for those of us that are questioning some of those principles to think about, that would be great too. Um, with that, I just want to thank everybody. I guess we should clap at the end, huh? We can see the audience, so, you know, let's all clap for our panel. Um, and I am going to stop the recording. Thanks so much.